it's not a new problem either. I mean, yes, we have more information and that's like a blessing. Um, <laughs> it's not, the, the information age is no more a problem than iron was in the iron age, but the, the, like Lao Tzu said two and a half millennia ago to, to gain knowledge, add things every day, to gain wisdom, subtract things every day. And, you know, every there, you can go find a quote from every a hundred years since of somebody reminding us of that. And I think the neat reason we need the reminders is because it's hard. And so, I mean, how do you bake subtraction into this kind of knowledge management system, right? I mean, one of the things I talk about in the book and is one of the most powerful forms of learning, both for yourself and for society is to say, okay, this is something that I used to believe or used to think is important and I no longer do. I'm Srini Rao, and this is the Unmistakable Creative Podcast, where you get a window into the stories and insights of the most innovative and creative minds who've started movements, built thriving businesses, written best selling books, and created insanely interesting art. For more, check out our 500 episode archive at unmistakablecreative.com. Lighty, welcome to the Unmistakable Creative. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here, Srini. It is my pleasure to have you here. So I actually got a hold of your book, Subtract the Untapped Science of Less. Uh, oddly enough, before your publicist sent me a pitch saying, hey, did we want to have you as a guest? And I was like, well, yeah, of course, because I plan on reaching out to you eventually anyways. But um, before we get into the book, I want to start with what might be a very odd question, but given that I think of you sort of as a social scientist, and that is what birth order were you and what impact did that end up having on the choices that you made with your life and your career? Uh, interesting. First, first in my family. Um, and so, and I've got a younger sister who's a year and a half younger than me and a younger brother who's a five years younger than me. Uh, and the impact, I think, um, one thing that comes immediately to mind is, I mean, my younger sister is a total badass. I mean, she's like, uh, you know, medical school at Johns Hopkins, division one athlete, you know, the top award at her school for sports and academics, um, you know, three beautiful kids, a great husband. Uh, and so I can relate. Yeah. <laughs> so it's horrible, right? This is your younger sister. And, you know, this goes all the way back. I remember when I was, I think I was like second grade and all my friends came running in they're like somebody beat Derek Baldwin in a race on the playground and Derek Baldwin was like this uh second grader who should have been a third grader and was just like faster than everybody else and I was like who beat him who beat him and it was my little sister had beat Derek Baldwin <laughs> in her race and you know so this is like constantly happening to me I mean I, I remember doing like a jumping competition with my aunts and uncles and my sister could jump farther than me when she was five and I was seven you know so I, I think anytime I started to uh, rest on my laurels or think I was good because I was like beating people my own age, I had this reminder of this little sister who was better than me at stuff. So that definitely yeah. um, kept me motivated. Also just, you know, it kept me in, inspired, uh, you know, part of it is competition, but the other part of it is seeing like somebody do these amazing things and seeing that it's her, her work ethic and her intelligence, um, yeah. and realizing that those are things that I also can, can copy. Um, so, so there's been that impact. I I'd also say that, um, you know, being the, the older, my brother, the relationship was a lot different because I mean, when you're five years apart, you're basically, I, I remember not having like a, a conversation with him where we're on the same level really until after I came back from college and, mm -hmm. you know, I come back from college and you're like, Oh, Rick, that's my brother's name. He's all grown up now. You know, he can, you can have like a big kid conversation with him and now we're kind of peers. And so that, um, uh, in terms of education, but he's also, he's a econom economics professor. Um, and I'm an engineering professor by training and, uh, a lot of the social science stuff I've picked up in conversations with him. Um, and so, so certainly it is, uh, it's helped me that way with the brother and sister. And then the last thing I would say with the, like the relationship with the parents, I mean, the first kid in my family, I mean, my parents are both amazing parents uh, and they spent a lot of focus on getting it right with me. And we're very, um, 
uh, I mean, sh- strict, but not strict in a way where they're going to like hit me if I was doing things wrong, just like high expectations for the first kid. And, you know, I, yeah. there's a, a famous story in our family where my dad made, um, made me retake, uh, an exam. Um, and I, I got educated in New York state and they had this like standardized statewide test that, you know, people got different scores on and I had gotten like an 86 on it, which was one of the highest grades in the class. But my dad made me go to summer school for it because he's like, no, you have to, you have to have an A. And so that I'm there in summer school with all these people who failed it. Right. And, yeah. and then there's me who like, I'm there because I need to get my grade up five more points, which, you know, it was just like a hard iteration of the test was why I got an 86. But anyway, I mean, so my parents really, um, you know, paid a lot of attention and were, uh, you know, had had high standards for us and not necessarily high standards in what they wanted, but high standards in what, what we wanted. Um, Mm -hmm. And so all of those things affected us. And I think, you know, my brother, for example, by the time he came through high school, my parents had gone through it with my sister and I, and they were quite a bit more relaxed um, as to what he was allowed to do. Totally. Yeah, no, I can, I can relate. I, it's funny because we, we seem to have like very parallel paths. So my sister is a, uh, you know, same thing, med school grad, 3.97 GPA at Berkeley, <laughs> chief anesthesiology resident at Yale and, you know, fellowship at UCLA. And I, I remember talking to a, a buddy of mine from Berkeley who, you know, coincidentally was a Harvard neurosurgeon. He's like, yeah, your sister is like every Indian parent's dream come true. And I'm just like, well, that would make me every Indian parent's nightmare come true. Yeah. <laughs> What was her, uh, what was her non a in my sister had that same exact GPA and she got a, she got a B like her, her second Organic semester of her fourth year. Oh, okay. Well, at least with your sister, it's like a legit class to get a yeah. bad grade in. My sister just got a bad grade in a class where the professor, not a bad grade, a B where the professor just didn't give any A's. And, uh, yeah. oh, my brother and I just loved that so much because it ruined her four O the last semester, but that's hilarious. Well, yeah, no, I mean, my, my sister was one of those people people that it was kind of right from the get-go we were like you know we knew she was just smarter than all of us i mean we took her to nasa when we were kid you know we lived in houston or texas and so we would take Uh people to nasa because back in those days that's what you know you you were able to do there as a tourist attraction people would go to nasa and so we're taking this tour of nasa and um you know they tell my sister about the atomic clock right and the atomic clock supposedly only goes wrong every 100 years and, uh-huh. you know, you imagine this like four year old raises her hand and says, OK, great. How do you know this is true? And <laughs> the guy looks at her and says, well, somebody told me. And she says, do you believe everything everybody tells you? And my dad and I are just like, oh, my God, like a four year old. And so it's kind of the joke is like if you're in a room with my sister, she's the smartest person in the room. Uh-huh. Uh, but that actually you know, segues to a question that I have for you. So you allowed that to inspire you. And it, I, I can tell you for me watching my sister, there was a really long period of time where I had this just immense inferiority complex about the fact that she had done everything that people consider successful by, you know, typical Indian standards. I mean, doctor, you know, being a doctor is like the most noble thing you could do. I could yeah. win a Nobel Peace Prize and people would be like, yeah, you're still not a doctor. Yeah. So I wondered, how did you like, how do you balance the sort of you know, finding inspiration in, in, you know, a younger sibling who is, you know, so accomplished, but at the same time, not letting it become an inferiority complex. Yeah, I don't, I mean, I'm not as bold as you where I went and, you know, did something that's kind of totally out of the norm for, you know, my parents aren't Indian, obviously, but they're, I think they've like have some of those same stereotypes of um, caring about certain professions. And it's not like I was, you know, doing podcasting and then my sister came along and went to medical school. It was more like I was doing a okay job in my career, in in academia, in, um, in engineering. And then my sister goes to medical school and I'm like, Hmm, I wonder if I could do a PhD. Uh, and so I think, and I mean, the soccer is another example. So I went and I played division one soccer and, you know, I was like one of the, probably the first person from my town ever to do that. And I'm sitting there feeling good about myself that I, you know, started as a freshman in division one soccer. And then, but I played at a a small school in division one. And then my sister, you know, I'm, my uh, starting my junior year and my sister gets recruited to go play at Maryland, which is like top 10 division one soccer. And I'm like, 
great. Now, like, now what do I do to like, to, to seem cool compared to my sister? I need to, you know, not just <laughs> be on a division one soccer team, but we actually need to win some games or like win championships or something like that. And so I've always, it's never been, um, fortunately for me, it's never been where she's like so far on a different level that I haven't been able, it's always been like, Oh, well I can do something that's like one or two steps away from what I'm currently doing. It's not like a total career shift for me. And then, I mean, the things where it's, uh, I mean, this is easier now that I'm 43 and she's Mm -hmm. 41 as than when I was seven, but um, the, the, the things where she's just like, on a different level and I'm never going to catch her. Of course, now that I'm a little more grown up, I'm okay with that. I guess when I was a, yeah. a kid, I, I think I, you just kind of uh, create your own things that are important and say that, well, I don't care about, you know, grades in, in, uh, in undergrad because that's, um, you know, I'm focused on other things. So I, I guess I kind of like shifted the goalposts a little bit for myself. And that, that helped with the fact that she was, such a rock star in the conventional ways. Yeah. Well, it's funny. We we're exactly the same age. And I think for me, it's been kind of the same sort of experience, right? It's, it's like, I, you know, I had a self-published book that was a wall street journal bestseller. And I remember, you know, when I, that's got insane. Book, you know, yeah. Uh, that's amazing. We'll, we'll talk about that off air, but like um, yeah. <laughs> when I, I remember when I got my book deal, one of the things I wanted to be able to do is tell my dad, this is actually harder than getting into medical school. So <laughs> I remember asking my, my editor at Penguin I was like, okay, what are the actual odds that somebody ends up here in your office? And she said about one in 5,000. I'm like, uh-huh. Dad. and so I go home. It's like, Dad, you realize like one in five thousand people get a book deal. That's less people than get you know into med school. Didn't make a damn bit of difference. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> uh, so, that's funny. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I think that makes a, a perfect segue to talking specifically about education um, in general. Mm-hmm. You know, we're we're you know, it's funny because we're talking about sort of markers for success and, uh, you know, and it's funny because then it's also very relevant to the whole idea of subtract because there's a sort of just relentless drive for more, right. You know, Mm -hmm. more AP classes, more extracurricular activities, you know, better grades, you know, like higher GPAs, more is kind of the default narrative of, of, of our culture. Um, and you being, you know, in a professor, uh, you know, like an, an educational institution, especially one like, you know, University of Virginia, which I know is kind of uh, like a Berkeley. It's one of the best public schools in the country. You, if you were tasked with redesigning the education system to accommodate the needs of students today so that they are prepared for the world that they're going to encounter when they graduate, what would you change about it? When buying gifts for others, you know your choices impact lives in ways big and small, now and forever. When you choose to buy and give handcrafted items, they not only look great, they feel great because they're high quality and not mass made. Celebrate the ones you love with a gift from Etsy, one of a kind and meaningful gifts made by incredibly talented sellers. Etsy is giving first-time shoppers $10 off an Etsy purchase of $35 with code ETSYGIFT10. That's $10 off an Etsy purchase of $35 with code ETSYGIFT10. Offer ends December 31st, 2021. See terms at Etsy.com slash terms. This season, give more than a gift want the can't stop won't stop watching sort of stuff you know the dramatic stuff amc plus has it all would you go to war for your family don't miss kin the all-new irish gangland drama ready to raise the stakes catch up on the latest episodes of the walking dead's epic final season nostalgic for tv's golden age amc plus is the home of mad men plus meet a sitcom wife like no other and kevin can f himself starring annie murphy available ad free on demand and on the platforms you're already on sign up today at amcplus.com amc plus only the good stuff this episode of the unmistakable creative is supported by the longtime academy a new podcast about how to be a good ancestor it's a show about time and how we think about time short-term thinking can be really stressful, and some of us find it difficult to plan for tomorrow or next week, let alone next year or 10 years from now, and long-term thinking can help. If you've ever felt unproductive, exhausted, or worried about the future, or powerless to change the path our world is on, the Longtime Academy can help. You'll hear from people like Brian Eno, Celeste Headley, George the Poet, Roman Kersnerik, Jay Griffiths, and Adrian Murray Brown and learn how they embrace long-term thinking. The Longtime Academy is an audio documentary, but it also includes 
practical exercises designed to expand your sense of time and help you be a good ancestor. I got to check out an early episode of the Longtime Academy, and here's what I thought. Listening to the stories on the show causes you to reflect on the past, be more mindful about the present, and more deliberate about the future. So if you're sick of being overwhelmed by the day-to-day, always dwelling on the past, and always worried about what could go wrong in the future, listen to the Longtime Academy. Search for the Longtime Academy anywhere you listen to podcasts. We'll also include a link in the show notes. Life is short. Time is long. The Longtime Academy. And I realized we could do an hour podcast on that subject alone. Yeah, no, I have a lot of, th- I'm just trying to prioritize the top one. Uh, I, I, I mean, really high up there is thinking about the available, like the best ways to deliver the best available content. I mean, this notion that every single university should have a professor lecturing about, and I'll use an example from engineering. It's like, there's this course called statics and it's a course that everybody has to take. It's the same exact thing everywhere. Like, why do we have a, a substandard teacher? I mean, not substandard teacher, but somebody who's not the very best statics teacher teaching students that course. Um, and so is there some way that we can take advantage of the fact that you've got uh, maybe some amazing statics teacher who can deliver the content in kind of a conventional way that a lecturer would, but then also have people on the specific campuses that are helping uh helping the students really, you know, take the the content that's been delivered and then do the, do the actual problems. And so I think, you know, kind of the, the I think we've seen that the Coursera's of the world and the, you know, just online education in general, Khan Academy. I mean, these are all amazing things, but at the same time, they're not a substitute for in-person learning. Anybody who has <laughs> tried to learn during the pandemic or had people trying to learn during the pandemic has seen that. But if we we do need to think really carefully about what can be delivered in the in that kind of online format and what can be delivered in person, and then kind of segment those, uh, kind of take a step back, I think, and then come back to education and say, okay, this is this is what we're going to deliver as online stuff, and this is what we're going to deliver online or virtual, uh, and this is what we're going to deliver as in person things. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, no, that makes that makes complete sense. I mean, Seth Godin talks a lot about this and he says, you know, it's kind of absurd that people will spend, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to go listen to somebody lecture. And he said when the real value would be to get those groups of students into a discussion and watch the lecture at home. Yeah. And I mean, again, this is something I try really hard to do and 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 explain that to students, right? Because it's really hard to break them out of that thinking, but it's like, okay, what makes university of Virginia good? It's like, yeah, we've got some good professors, but the, the, the thing that is distinguishing this university is your, your peers. And this is me talking to the students, right? You are going to school with these amazing students from all walks of life who have tons of things to, to share with you now. And after you graduate and into the future. So if we're not, if we're, if we're bringing you together in a classroom and not allowing you to talk to each other, we're missing the biggest opportunity. Uh, so I would, I would agree with that one. I think that's one big thing that needs to change with education. Um, I do think we're, this is a little old, uh, not old fashioned, uh, I, but I, it maybe not talked about as much. I think that the, the role of, in terms of con- con- contributing to knowledge, like science, right? The, the the university has these people who have time to study things that don't have an immediate profit motive mm-hmm. is yeah. like, that needs to be ruthlessly protected and it's getting eroded away. I mean, it's, you know, more and more, it's like, okay, what are we doing for entrepreneurship? Which again, I'm not saying that creating new knowledge is the most important thing, I'm just saying that this is one of the only places that that can happen. And if we, if we don't keep doing it here, nobody else is going to, it's like everybody's doing entrepreneurship and the universities get so caught up in profit motives and okay, run the universities like a business. And it's like, yeah, yeah, to certain, certain elements. Sure. But we can't lose this um, learning for learning sake and creating knowledge for creating knowledge's sake, because 
again, that's the that's the unique niche in society that this institution can fill and has done a really good job filling historically. So I, as we kind of modernize, I think that's one, like maybe a little bit of getting back to the roots there of what academia can do that um, other, other sectors don't necessarily. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think the irony of that is that, you know, prioritizing the creation of knowledge for the sake of knowledge actually fuels entrepreneurship. Like we wouldn't have scientific breakthroughs mm-hmm. that lead to companies if people weren't doing that. Exactly. Yeah. And we need, that's another thing that we need to do in academia is show how that's happening, right? We can't just rely on other people to communicate that for us because of course the, you know, we're, it's not that we're creating knowledge that we don't think will ever be useful. It's just, we don't know 100% how it will be useful. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and it, it's certainly, that is, there's a huge societal value to it um, in, in most cases. Well, I mean, speaking of, of knowledge that's useful, you, this is something I've talked about on the show before and, and something I'd be curious to hear from your perspective, particularly, you know, at a place like UVA. When I got to Berkeley, basically life, you know, the, the options were presented to me like a fast food menu. It was kind of like, these are the majors, these are the four oh, five yeah. potential career paths that, you know, each of them will lead to choose one, you know, and make a commitment to it. And it's like, wait a minute. So I'm making a decision about what I'm going to do with my entire fucking life before I've lived any of it. And yeah. so people, and, and then you think, well, of course people end up in jobs they hate because of this. Now you probably get to talk to students, you know, like early in life enough that you can have an influence on them. One, why is that the case? How do you break them of that condition? Because I can tell you that I always made every single choice based on whatever I thought would get me a job. And I distinctly remember three weeks into freshman year, which is ridiculous. I go into a career fair, you know, which is meant for seniors. I talked to some guy who, you know, I think worked at Anderson Consulting, which eventually became Accenture. And he tells right. me we don't hire English majors. And so I never <laughs> took an English. So that was the end of my decision to be an English major. And I've never yeah. once applied for a job there. You know, and yeah. I feel like that happens to so many students. Yeah, oh, I'm so glad you brought that up. I mean, that, I might even put that higher on my list of things to change about education is just, uh, I mean, I, I get we need to have these categories, but the the over-reliance on these categories, I mean, um, I, I, first of all, I'm an engineer for this very reason. Like, that's why I'm sitting in an engineering building. I went to school and they said, for engineering, you have to decide before you even come in, right? It's like, if you don't start yeah. in engineering, you can't switch in because you've, you'll have you be behind. You won't have taken Calc 1, 2, and 3. And so I started in engineering. And then every year, I would go to my advisor and say, I don't know if I really like engineering. <laughs> and, and I mean, fortunately, I went, to a, I went to Lafayette College as an undergrad. And so like liberal arts and engineering school. And so the advisors offered what I think was the right advice. They said, you know, you can do engineering. You don't have to be an engineer and it's a good platform for these other things. And I was at a school where, you know, even the engineers had to take, uh, you know, basically 25% of our credits in writing the first few, four years. Uh, and so I, it was a, a good baseline, but, you know, it, this decision that I made when I was 18 years old based on, oh, you can't do this if you don't do it now is is influencing my life to this day. So personally, I have succumbed to that. I, I think, you know, maybe I'm just justifying this after the fact, but in my case, I don't think it's been bad. And but now when I talk to students, the exact thing that you're talking about happens. I mean, it's not just majors here. We have these ridiculous minors. And then like in our in our department, we have subtracts within civil engineering and so students are coming to me like should i major in i don't know if i want to do the infrastructure systems track or the environmental track and oh no this is gonna and you know of course try to figure out what you're most interested in but this matters zero after you get your first job or probably not even when you get your first job in this case because no employer knows that UVA even has these subtracts they're not asking the students about this um so to to break them of it I, I mean I spend a lot of time saying it doesn't matter um and I, I can draw on personal experience for that after I I uh after I did my undergrad degree, I played professional soccer for a couple of years. And then I went and worked in the construction industry, which was kind of like the consulting industry version of what civil engineers do. And, you know, I just saw firsthand that it didn't 
there were all these people in this industry and it didn't matter what major they had. It mattered how smart they were, how much they liked their job and how, how good they did at it. And, um, so I, I draw on that experience to tell students that it doesn't matter and not to stress out about it too much. And, uh, and really, you know, your question about getting a job, right? I mean, that's the exact for students at Berkeley and UVA, the question is not whether you're going to get a job. If you can't get a job, then something <laughs> is like fundamentally wrong with the economy, right? We've got bigger yeah. problems than you getting a job. The, the question is what's going to be a fulfilling life for you. And that's, you know, it's not something you're going to figure out in the first three weeks of college, but it's something that you should start thinking about. And that's the way to be thinking about the career stuff. So that's what I try to um, help them help them think about, but I do, I mean, the other, I mean, it's, it, it really is something that we do that's detrimental <laughs> to the students because it's the only time in your life too, where this whole, it's the first question everybody gets asked, right? What's your major? And it's, mm -hmm. it's it, and it, so of course they're going to think that this is like a really important thing and never again in your life is that the first question you're asked. I mean, you might get asked as the first question, like, what's your job, but that's the quite different than what, what your, what your major is. And so we, we make it seem like this thing is that really matters when in fact it doesn't. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I think the the common thread I've, I've heard when I've asked people similar questions, uh, you know, we had uh, Sarah Stein Greenberg here who's a professor at Stanford and she said, you know, this should really be a period of exploration. Yeah. But sadly, it's not. It's one that sort of kills curiosity and, you know, replaces it with conformity. You know, like I had the sort of same experience. I was like, you know, here's Berkeley, this incredibly diverse place with all this really smart people. And I'm like, this place is a breeding ground for conformity. Like everybody is a future lawyer, doctor, investment banker. Um, hmm. like those are the most sort of sought after professions. And, you know, to me, that was just, I feel like I missed out, you know, like I, I look back now and think to myself, I'm like, wow, this is, you re this really kind of limited my experience in terms of what was possible in college. But I think part of that is also the conditioning, right? I mean, so I, I'd imagine a student at UVA is very similar to a student at Berkeley, me meaning that they probably half of them were valedictorians of their high school. They're probably the smartest person in their class. Not that I was like my group of friends in high school is so smart that the dumbest ones went to Berkeley. Uh, <laughs> like we were the dumb people like it. And, yeah. you know, but then you get to a place like Berkeley and suddenly you realize, holy shit, these people are way smarter than I am. Like there were times when I thought I didn't belong there. Mm -hmm. um, but, and even when I went to speak to my high school AP English teachers class, after I got my um, book deal, I was stunned by how worried they were about what they wanted to do with their lives. And that just seemed, you know, like such a waste to have taken this period of your life where you have this freedom to explore and then you don't. You know, like, like there's no time in your life. I, I always say if I went back to college now, yeah, I would approach college like Van Wilder. <laughs> yeah, it's a, uh, it's true. It's like the worry, right? The, it should, it shouldn't be a worry about what you're going to do. It should be like all this amazing anticipation about what you can set yourself up for. What do you think about a, a gap year? I never would have done this because I was so focused on soccer that it, like I, and you needed, that was the way to play soccer was to start. But I do think that, I mean, when I went back for my PhD, for example, I'm five years out of college, I'm sitting in this class and it's like on the, on the surface, the most dull class ever. It's a research methods class, but I'm there with four other students and this brilliant researcher who's, you know, telling us the inner workings of her brain and how she does research. And I'm like, this is the most amazing experience ever. And I think I appreciated it because I had seen the working world first. Um, and I don't, I, I, you know, this isn't a scientific study of all the students I've ever taught, but I do think that like some of these students who have done, you know, whether it's military service or just something for a couple of years, and then they come back or totally, they're engaging with school in a much different way than the students who are just doing it as the next step in, in the steps of things that they're supposed to do. Yeah. And it, it's funny because, you know, I, I remember talking to Cal Newport about the, the, the book, How to Be a Straight A Student. He said that that book was written specifically for the type of student you're talking about. And I very, mm -hmm. I very distinctly remember like when we had junior transfers come into Berkeley, they mm -hmm. all came in with sky high GPAs. They absolutely killed it because I think they just knew they'd kind of acclimated to, you know, life in college. Whereas when you go straight to a four-year college, it's kind of like, oh, 
you're thrown into this you know, new environment, trying to find a sense of identity and, you, you know, layer on top of that, you know, all the classes you have to take, you know, surrounded by, you know, this sort of you know, ruthless competition. I had a uh, colleague of my dad's uh, in high school tell me once, he said, you know, if you survive undergrad at Berkeley, everything in life that comes after will seem easy in comparison. And, you mm -hmm. know, I think there was a grain of truth to that because it's not a pleasant place to go to school. It's not for undergrad. That's, I wonder, I mean, that's another thing where, that I think a lot about because, I mean, of course, you assign a lot of work. The students are going to have to do a lot of work. It's going to force them. It's going to force a certain type of thing, right? A, a work ethic. You're going to learn a certain amount of things. You're going to learn how to prioritize your time. And then the other side of that is it, it takes away any sense of exploration. I mean, like I didn't, the only time in my life where I didn't read was as an undergrad in college because I didn't have time to. And mm -hmm. so I don't know. It's like there's how yeah. do you how do you balance this giving people flexibility to to study things that that they want to with this very real need to um to have them actually learn stuff and in particular I think it's really valuable to at some point just learn that you can do really hard things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think I mean, I'd imagine in a lot of ways, UVA has a lot of similarities being a public school. It's just, you know, endless amounts of bureaucracy and bullshit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Berkeley is a pain in the ass to live in, like almost every yeah. place you could rent to live as a shithole. You know, but I remember <laughs> seeing the comparison, you know, with friends like I one of my friends who went to UCSF for med school, he told me that when people came to UCSF from Berkeley, they found it really easy. She And he said the people who came from Stanford actually found it much harder. And my sister said the exact same thing. She said med school was a breeze in comparison to Berkeley. Um, but, you know, I think that that, you know, segues perfectly into one sort of final question about education, which is the value that we place on elite universities, you know, mm -hmm. um, to the point where, you know, you have high school school districts like Palo Alto with a crazy teen suicide rate, largely caused by this pressure to succeed. You end up with a college admissions scandal and then you riddle students with student loan debt. Uh, you know, from your vantage point as a professor, how do you, one, solve this problem of, you know, perception of the value of, of sort of an elite school, which don't get me wrong, I'm not questioning that there is some value, right? I mean, you're a professor yeah. at UVA, I'm a Berkeley grad. Look, I'd be lying to you if I told you that didn't open certain doors. I saw it firsthand in the contrast because I went to Pepperdine for mm -hmm. my MBA program. And I saw, you know, when you were at Berkeley, McKinsey, Bain, Google, like all the companies that people dreamed about working at, they came to recruit students at Berkeley. Nobody mm -hmm. came to recruit anybody at Pepperdine. Um, so there's no question that that carries some weight. But the thing is, I think we place so much value on it. And now, you know, it's so bad. It, my sister and I know we're both like, if we had to compete now to get into any of the schools we got into, we wouldn't get in. Like I wouldn't it have is, gotten into Berkeley now. Yeah, it is crazy. I mean, I've got a seven-year-old and you're looking at what the... The high school age, I mean, kids who are 10 years away from where he is right now are doing to prepare their college applications, and it's ridiculous. Um, I, one cool solution I've seen, uh, Barry Schwartz, he wrote The Paradox of Choice, and he's, uh, yeah. I think he's a, actually a Berkeley professor now. Uh, he was at Swarthmore for a long time. Yeah, I remember His, that. Yeah. He has this cool idea for, I think it's basically like a, um, a lottery. And I mean, I, I you can Google the article and make sure that it's exactly what he's saying. But my understanding of it was like, okay, yeah, there is some value uh, to a, a student that has, or to a university that has a better student to faculty ratio. Right. And, but, but the difference between Harvard and Yale or Berkeley and UVA, or, you know, it's, there isn't a difference and the students are picking based on, trivial things like, you know, the, the architecture of the campus or, you know, where your friend <laughs> went or, you know, where, where your sister got in. Uh, and the, so his point was, okay, you get people into categories and then just do a lottery that, you know, kind of sends people off to, to universities. And, um, so it takes away some of the really strong pressure, um, for, you know, finding one specific place and focuses people a little more just on like, okay, doing the things that you need to be prepared to be in one of these, um, to, to go to, to go to a college, uh, that, that helps you develop. Um, I will, I mean, and I, I also like that 
I mean, Malcolm Gladwell has a bunch of stuff on, you know, that's kind of poo-pooing the whole notion of elite universities in the first place. And I, uh, like, he's like, if you were going to donate, I remember this because um, he said, you know, if you're going to donate uh, $10 million, donate it to Rowan University instead of Stanford. And it's, I mean, I don't know. Um, with the, If you're trying to make social impact, I, I think there's still an argument to be made for um, that these kind of elite institutions that are doing really great stuff that combine some of the, the best minds and like put them in this environment there's there's value to that i mean of course there's also value to the the rowan universities that are serving tons of students but um so i i I don't want to say like oh all college education should be exactly the same and i do think that there's a you know there's a reason that some universities cost more i mean sometimes that reason is because they have fancy amenities and good dining halls but other times it's because they have a really low student to faculty ratio which means that they can offer writing classes where the professor has time to come on on everybody's assignment um and so so anyway barry schwartz lottery system is a is a good suggestion but I, i do you know for any high school kids who are listening yeah focus on figuring out what you what you like and being being great at it and the university stuff will fall into place people who value sleep sleep on a nectar mattress but you're not going to believe me after all i might be lying i must be lying The only thing you know is true is that commercials lie to you. I must be lying. Instead of believing silly commercials, trust the more than 2 million happy sleepers who sleep on a Nectar mattress. Nectar Sleep is currently running their biggest offer ever. $399 in accessories plus $100 off. A 365-night home trial and free shipping and returns. Go to Nectarsleep.com today. Even though my family is filled with amazing cooks me being in the kitchen is basically a fire hazard waiting to happen but i still want to eat healthy and if you want to eat healthier and feel your best then listen up this is hands down one of the easiest ways i've been drinking something called cachava as my breakfast to fuel my day it keeps me full for hours and it takes less than a minute to make which is pretty awesome so what is it it's been called the cleanest most nutrient dense meal imaginable and i describe it as the best protein vitamins and everything you need to eat healthy all in one shake It's loaded with over 70 superfoods and nutrients like maca root, chia seeds, sachaini, makai berry, acai, and coconut. And it actually tastes really good. The people who built this company started in the jungle on the side of a mountain during a health retreat. And their mission is to bring the world's best superfoods into a single ready-to-go meal to help busy people stay healthy on the go. And Kachava is offering 10% off for the listeners of our podcast. Just go to kachava.com slash creative. Again, that's Kachava. K-A-C-H-A-V-A dot com slash creative for 10% off. Yeah, I think the the one funny thing I, I always feel like when I think about that advice is that I wonder if I would have been open-minded enough to even consider, you know, the practicality of it when I was 18 years old, or I would have been like, you're an old fart who has no idea what you're talking about. This sounds like a, like literally the things I've learned from my guests, I would have written off as new age bullshit when I was 18 years old. Right. Yeah, that's true. Um, and you just don't know, right? You don't even know what the options are. You're like, oh, you can do anything you want. And then you're like, okay, well, I can be a professor like my dad or a computer programmer like my mom. Those are the two things that I would have known about. Or I can yeah. like mow grass, which is what my summer job is, you know? So you just don't <laughs> have exposure to like these things that you can do to make a difference in the world. So, I mean, there is that part of it with the majors. And I guess maybe that's what we should be doing a better job of is explaining to people that these are just, you know, we're just showing you potential paths. We're not forcing you into narrow boxes that are going to define you for the rest of your life. Yeah. Well, speaking of potential paths, I think that that makes a perfect segue to actually getting finally into the content of the book. Um, (laughs) So, what in the world led to this book, this perspective? Um, you know, like, how did you get interested in this subject and how did it lead to this book? Yes. I mean, I'm an engineer by training, um, but I think the issue that I try to have my research be relevant to are environmental issues and um, climate change in particular. Uh, so, exploring those two things for a long time, um, it just became really clear that a lot of these things that we build and design and ways that we act that are not sustainable, that are kind of helping, not helping our 
species thrive on this planet. A lot of these things our behavior, right? The, the technology is there. We know how to make a net zero energy house. We know how to use electric cars. We know how to zoom instead of travel to Europe for a conference. Um, and so of course, keep advancing the, the technology and the widgets, but like, how do we understand human behavior and how that impacts the, you know, the state of the planet. And as I've, Working on that, I got interested in like, okay, what are the fundamental mindsets that might be holding us back? And that brought me to, um, I mean, I'd always been interested in kind of minimalist architecture and, oh, it's cool that, you know, that house there works without a central heating and air conditioning system. I mean, if you're in Boulder, Colorado, there's a house in in Snowmass, for example, that um, that doesn't have central heating or cooling, survives in that climate and, you know, provides a very comfortable indoor living environment for occupants. And this is something that we know how to do. Um, And so why aren't, why aren't we doing it more? And um, so eventually I got to, okay, the the thing I'm interested in is not like this end state of minimalism where there's like no HVAC system or there's no uh, extra frills on a building. It's more what's this act of getting to there? So what's this act of, of taking away? And funny enough, I was um, the, the biggest, the closest thing to an epiphany, I guess, came when I was playing with my son, he was three at the time, and we were playing with Legos and building a bridge out of the Legos. And the problem we had was the bridge wasn't level. And so I went to make it level. I turned around behind me to grab a block to add to the shorter column. And by the time I had turned back around, he had removed a block from the longer column. And he's a horrible subtractor. But um, in that moment, he had thought to solve the problem by taking something away. And um, that really crystallized the thing that the book's about, which is when we encounter problems uh, or situations, whether they're physical things like the Legos or, you know, a uh, a piece of writing, a a podcast that you need to edit. Uh, Why is it our first instinct to think, what can we add to this, uh, to this situation? And only subsequently do we think, what can we subtract? And oftentimes we don't even think what we can subtract. And um, it wasn't just, it didn't just go from the, the Lego bridge to the book. I mean, we did tens of thousands of hours of research to show that. And we found that like what I had done in that situation is pretty typical for what happens with our core thinking process, which is we we're presented with a situation, we take it in. So we're looking at this Lego bridge, or you're looking at your, your own house that you want to renovate and make better, or you're looking at um, a piece of writing, or even the, you know, we talked about education and some of the problems there. It's like, you're looking at a, the outline for your course and the, 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 and you think, okay, how can I change this? How can I make this better? Arguably, this is like a fundamental thing, <laughs> not fundamental. This is this is like the core act of making society better. Um, and our first instinct is, is to think, what can we add to this? And what we found in our studies was that oftentimes people chose adding even it was objectively the wrong answer. Um, <laughs> and so we've got uh, my favorite study that we did is the, are these grid patterns. And what was cool about the grid patterns is they're devoid of context. Um, so you, when, when I added to the Legos, you might say, well, well, that's just because you grew up playing with Legos and you're used to adding. And then I might say, well, why did I grow up adding to Legos? But anyway, the, all of these specific contexts, you could make that same critique. Um, but the grid patterns are something that people hadn't encountered before. And you could make these, the task was to make grids symmetrical left to right and top to bottom. And you could, we put extraneous marks in one of the quadrants of the grids. Um, And so one way to make the grids symmetrical was to add to the three quadrants that didn't have the extraneous marks. Um, But we told people to do it in as few clicks as possible. The other way to, to make them symmetrical was to subtract from the quadrant that did have the marks. And that was the better way because it took fewer clicks. Um, and so people would would miss that. More than half the people would, would get that wrong. They would say, oh, they would add to three corners, even though the right answer was to subtract from one corner. And when you showed them that that was the right answer, they're like, oh, of course I got that wrong. Um, and the reason is because you think first to add, right? We, we process things sequentially. And so we think first to add, and then we move on 
without even considering whether subtracting may be a better option. So that's the, you know, that's chapter one of the book. And I mean, but the whole book relies on that new scientific insight that we, you know, we systematically think to add first, we systematically overlook subtraction. Um, and then, you know, I'll, I'll shut up in a second here, but <laughs> what, even after that, of course, you know, we can think of things. Um, well, the first problem with subtracting is that we don't even think of it. And then there are all these other reasons why, okay, why don't we think of it? But then even when we do think of it, we often don't choose it. Um, and so the book goes on to explain, to explore why, why has this happened? You know, what are the biological and cultural reasons, but then also what, what can we do about it? How can we find subtracting more? Cause you know, the argument that I make in the book is that this is an untapped opportunity. You know, we haven't been doing it very much. And, um, so there's, there's potential out there in taking things away to make our, our world a better place and to make our personal lives a better, better for ourselves. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll get into all of those, but, um, so one of the things you, you know, open the book by saying is that neglecting subtraction is harmful in our households, which now commonly contain more than a quarter of a million items. Someone has to organize and keep track of all those juicers, ill-fitting clothes, Legos, and long since deflated monkey balloons from family trips to San Francisco. We neglect subtraction in our institutions, in our governments, and in our families, we default to adding requirements. And it's kind of funny because it reminded me of a story because I, you know, it's, we're, we're working on a personal knowledge management course with this new note taking up mem. Okay. And information overload comes up over and over again as a big issue for people who are on our email list. And I was waiting to finish writing that section of the newsletter until I had my conversation with you because I was like, Oh, wait a minute. I'm like, I'm going to have a conversation with a guy who's an expert on this. I should wait. <laughs> uh, but you know, after reading that quote, it reminded me of a story with my mom. So my mom keeps our house like Buckingham palace. It's immaculate to the it's point awesome. where it drives people insane. Uh -huh. Um, I had a friend come over in high school and she's like, damn, your house is so clean. And I said, yeah, you see those pennies on the floor when my, when you leave, my mom is going to come in here and yell at me and say there are pennies all over the place. And that's exactly <laughs> what she did. So a couple of years ago, I was living at my parents' house and, you know, she was not happy with the state of my closet. Um, because she just didn't like, we're talking Buckingham palace to the point where if clothes are not hung symmetrically and don't look like you're in a oh damn goodness. department store, you'll get yelled at. So my solution um, was simple. I walked in and I got a garbage bag and I just dumped like four of them. I said, all right, cool. Problem solved. And she was like, don't be a smart ass. And I'm like, I'm not being a smart ass. And I realized the key to dealing with that situation was as somebody who naturally tends to, you know, let clutter accumulate was simply to have less stuff. But how, do, you know, so that's an example of how this harmed my relationship with my mom, <laughs> you know, which is, <laughs> You know, in my mind, you know, a really good thing that I figured out the key to making sure that my mom doesn't get irritated by my mess is simply to have less stuff. But I'm really curious, you know, we talked about institutions, but let's talk about governments in particular. Like, yeah. um, what I mean, it, what is it that minus, you know, the endless amounts of bureaucrats who don't seem to do anything but, you know, get on the news and bullshit, um, you know, economic theory, and that doesn't lead to any real action what can we subtract from government that would actually serve citizens in a better way? Yeah. I mean, I think the specific subtractions are, you know, up to the experts. I do think that one of the things that the research and I mean, experts, I say broadly, it doesn't have to be one of these bureaucrats who's spewing economic theory because I think there's experts in all walks of life. And I try to highlight them in the book. Um, uh, the, the example of the monkey balloons in San Francisco, for example, is from Sue Bierman, who is a neighborhood activist in San Francisco and uh, was instrumental in removing the Embarcadero Freeway from their waterfront, which is where my son got the monkey balloon, which is now stored in our house. So anyway, <laughs> um, with the with, with the experts in mind, um, but I think we like how do we remind ourselves to sub that subtracting is one basic option for improving government. And I, one of the things I learned about after writing the book, actually, um, it was, uh, in, from my understanding, British Columbia put in place a rule where if somebody came with a piece of, if you brought a piece of legislation, you had to suggest two pieces of legislation that were already on the books that could go. Um, and so it, it just was a, it's a really beautiful way of kind of, number one, forcing people to, not forcing people, but just reminding people to consider subtracting but also like tying it directly to the addition and this is kind of like the 
if you if people have a stop doing list, right? That you're oh, every week when I do my to-do list, I'm also gonna do a stop doing list. It's kind this is uh kind of the personal way where you might keep adding in check. And that was the policy way where you could keep adding in check. And what was interesting about the British Columbia example is of course it it turned things around. It would have to, right? The growth of regulation started to go down. And um, but then it the story I was told, at least, is that the people, they didn't need it anymore. They didn't need this requirement because people were thinking about ways to to make government better by by taking things away. Um, and so I think that example of, a, you know, what we found in our research is left to our own devices. We don't think of this. And um, and so if we can help ourselves think of it more with these reminders at the point of making the decision, um, that can be really useful across these sectors, um, including government. Mm -hmm. We'll we'll, we'll come back to the the productivity thing, because I think that's the part that's really going to be of interest to a lot of people listening. Um, Okay. You alluded earlier to the sort of biological reasons why we have this sort of instinct to add. Um, Mm -hmm. And when I thought of that and even read those sections of the books, a couple of things came up for me. We had a uh, woman here who had been a financial advisor to you know, billionaires, you know, very well off people. And, you know, of course, the the conversation about money came up and she said, you know, the thing that causes us so much misery is that as a society or as individuals, we have no idea what our definition of enough is. And Mm. so we basically just pursue more. What, so what is the biological drive for this just constant, you know, relentless pursuit of more? That's interesting. Um, Yeah, there's a couple. One is a little, well, I mean, so the biological things are things that have helped us pass on our genes. I mean, the the financial advisor example reminds me of pack rats um, and the pack rats, uh, when, when they study them, if you have a pack rat and they've got their stockpile of nuts, you take away their nuts and they immediately stockpile again. And you're like, oh, well, that's pretty rational, right? Because if my pantry was bare, I would stockpile. But then you have to remember that the pack rats aren't like thinking and planning ahead. They're just acting instinctively. And so their instinct is to acquire more. We all share that instinct when it comes to to food, at least. And in, in the case of the pack rats, yes, it's food, but it's also like stuff that they're it's resources, right? It's resources for the future. And so it's not hard to see how that could kind of extend to financial resources where we have this biological instinct to not be satisfied, to think that we don't have enough. Now, of course, I mean, the key distinction here with these biological reasons is that we're not beholden to them, right? I mean, we can think and plan and we can override instincts. Um, The other, so there's that kind of acquisitiveness that as it's tied to food, but also that extends across all of these other aspects of our life. Um, and then the one surprising one that I found was just this desire to display competence. Uh, in the, the famous biological example there is bower birds. They build these ornate nests and the male bird builds the nest. And then the female bower birds go around and look at the nests and decide who to mate with based on the, the nest that they like the best. Um, and then the, the funny thing is that females then go build a nest to shelter the children. So the whole point of the male's nest is just to show that the male is effective at interacting with the world. And the idea there is like, well, if this male is good at building a ornate nest there, they they also have good genes for finding food. And those would be good genes to, to have in my kid and to pass down to the next generation. Um, yeah. But that desire to display competence, right? I mean, we do that through, through building in the physical world and it's since been extended to, task completion, right? And so when we um, basically that getting through your to-do list or sitting in a redundant meeting or, um, you know, sending an email that's marginally useful, but shows that <laughs> shows that you're alive, right? Those are ways yeah. that we show competence. And that is a biological, uh, there's, there are biological roots to that. Um, so those are, you know, that acquisitiveness and that desire to display competence are things that we need to be aware of. I mean, that those are deep rooted things that we all have in us and that kind of, that definitely work against subtraction. Well, you know, it's funny because when you're talking about email, I couldn't help but laugh when you had mentioned this. You wrote that section where people were, you know, oh, yeah. were forwarding, you know, Cal Newport's article on, you know, email making professors stupid and discussing the entire thing over email. It was so great. I was so, I mean, uh, yeah, that was, 
thankfully I have this practice of, you know, just batching when I check my emails and I, I'm sure I would have, I don't know. I like to think I wouldn't have chimed in, but I very well could have, but then finally yeah. one of the professors pointed out the, the irony of this and, and the whole list just went quiet. Nobody even like acknowledged that it was a really good point. Everybody just yeah. kind of like curled up into their little corners. Well, and, so yeah. I, I think that, that, you know, you know, it makes a perfect thing. But something else I wanted to ask you about one of the things yeah. you say uh, in the book is that synaptic pruning is the name neuroscientists yeah. have given through this automated subtracting just as fruit trees grow limbs, we grow synaptic connections between the neurons in our brains. Mm -hmm. um, and it kind of made me wonder about our, you know, media consumption habits uh, yeah. and the way that we consume media today, because, you know, I, like if you look at one of our listeners, even probably, uh, and I've, I've seen this with people, they have like a hundred different podcasts they're listening to. Yeah. And they're like, <laughs> yeah. okay, wait a minute. Like, I create a podcast and I don't listen to any podcasts, that, you know, just because it's not my preferred form of media consumption, but it made me like, think about my reading habits too, because I read a lot of books just, you know, by the nature of the work that I do, like my brain yeah. is just like this encyclopedia of information, but it kind of made me wonder, it's like, okay, well, would I get more out of the content if I consumed less of it? Yeah. I mean, and that's, um, you were mentioning the note taking app and obviously there's a place for taking notes, but this, uh, that's, there's this productivity tip that has helped me a little bit, which is to take less notes, right? Yeah. And so it's like, I don't need to, after this conversation with you, sit there and write down or, or, or during the conversation, I'm not writing down everything that's happening. I mean, yeah, I might want to write down a couple of things that I might not otherwise remember, but like the big ideas that you've shared uh, are things that I am going to remember, right? They're not going to get pruned by my synapses. Uh, <laughs> and so I think... Um, just being aware that uh, that that's what our our minds naturally do, um, but then also exactly as you said, if you're not uh, if you're not, you can also consciously do it, I guess. Uh, mm -hmm. And so you know, think about what you're allowing into your precious mental space. I mean, I think the we're amazing in terms of how much information we can accumulate, but it's, there are limits somewhere. And if you're, yeah. um, I've, you know, I found myself running on a treadmill, watching the news, listening to a podcast <laughs> and my running, I mean, my running time is when I think of important things. Like that's where I think of like the title of a book or what I want my next project to be. And not, but not if I'm listening to a podcast and watching the news at the same time. So, yeah. so I mean, the, I'd be the last person, the last thing I would want to say is like, okay, don't accumulate knowledge, right? Don't, don't allow information into your brain, but you do need to be kind of conscious about how we let it in and also think about how, how much time we're devoting to processing it, right. And prioritizing it. And I think that's what the, you know, note-taking apps can help with, right. Is that totally. this is, helps you organize what you think is most important and keeps you focused on the the stuff that's important to you and and helps you set a filter for what you might not let in to the to our precious mental space. Yeah, it's funny because as I it was just, you know, wrapping up the book notes for, you know, um your book before our conversation and getting them into to my note taking app, you know, I just, yeah. you know, took it took a break and I had an idea for a blog post titled information overload is making us, you know, uh, stupid, unproductive and poor. And I'm like, wow, I was like, I did not expect that to come from this. But um, <laughs> so, you know, the reason and, and I'll tell you where that that idea came from, because I think it, it there's, you know, a grain of truth to this. And because I'm building this personal knowledge management course and I've gotten to this section on, OK, now that we've laid the foundations for this, which was, you know, relentless filtering and prioritization, mm -hmm. let's talk about how to actually build this in a way that you don't feel like you're losing your mind because, you know, there, there were two common threads I saw when we did the, the research for, you know, what people's biggest issues were. One was the fact that they could never remember where the hell they put anything. So they couldn't retrieve information. It's like they would take these yeah. notes and those notes would be useless because they didn't know where the hell they were at. I was like, okay, I can figure out how to solve that problem. But the thing that you made, you made a really good point was to take less notes. Um, but this quote in particular struck me. You said too much information threatens our mental health from persistent frustration of interrupting emails, 
to the clinical anxiety born from overload of shopping choices, too much information endangers the participation required for a functioning democracy. People are inundated with so much content, good and bad, that it's hard to separate the signal from the noise. We can systematically consider the merits of every you know, baby crib mattress or learn the nuances of it, uh, of every candidate's plan or you know, frightening lack thereof for responding to climate change. And that is spot on. You know, like I think about an average day that I go and read things on Medium. And, you know, reading that made me wonder, it's like, okay, am I going to actually fucking use this in any way at all? Like, why am I reading this? It, mm-hmm. it made me want to stop and say, okay, like, maybe I don't need to read this. Um, maybe there's nothing that's useful. Like, to the point where even in my newsletter, I said, you know, I'm writing this newsletter about a personal knowledge management system and how to build one. If that's not one of your goals or priorities at the moment, you should stop reading this email and delete it. Uh-huh. Yeah. So how do we deal with this? I mean, every reader here has heard all of Cal Newport's ideas, um, mm-hmm. which are fantastic. Uh, some of which have challenges for a lot of people, I think. I mean, because I think it's it's not like we don't intellectually understand all of this stuff. It's just, yeah. you know, whether we take, you know, intellectual understanding doesn't necessarily translate into practical action, though. And it's a it's not a new problem either. I mean, yes, we have more information and that's like a blessing. Um, <laughs> it's not the, the information age is no more a problem than iron was in the iron age, but the, the, like Lao Tzu said two and a half millennia ago to, to gain knowledge, add things every day, to gain wisdom, subtract things every day. And, you know, every there, you can go find a quote from every a hundred years sense of somebody reminding us of that. And I think the neat reason we need the reminders is because it's hard. And so, I mean, how do you bake subtraction into this kind of knowledge management system, right? I mean, one of the things I talk about in the book and is one of the most powerful forms of learning, both for yourself and for society is to say, okay, this is something that I used to believe or used to think is important and I no longer do. Right. And I, I, yeah. I screwed this up earlier in the conversation. I'm talking about one of our fundamental things is contributing to knowledge as professors. And that kind of implies adding, but if you look at Nobel prize winners, very often they're you know, subtracting the the prevailing idea. That's the revolutionary thing in, in social thought. And when you think about that from your own personal growth and development, I mean, what has more influence, um, you know, adding on one more little nugget of, stuff onto some topic that you're already really good at or is it you know kind of subtracting out something that you thought that was wrong and was holding you back in your mental model so it's like how do you how do you subtract ideas from your own mental models and this is hard i mean there's a whole a lot of this research actually came out of uc berkeley but there's you know there's this whole trend in education to help people identify misconceptions common misconceptions that people brought into their classrooms and um it's well-meaning because the idea being that like, how do you build knowledge on top of something that isn't right in the first place, but scholars eventually gave up trying because you know, it's just really hard to get people to get rid of their misconceptions. They modify them instead. One of the, the story I use in the book is Santa Claus. And when I was, my son loves Legos and Santa Claus brought him Legos. And, but that he was like, well, what, what the hell? Why did Santa Claus bring me Legos? I thought he just had wood, right? I thought he just had like this wood workshop up there. And how did he make Legos? And I said, oh, for Legos, he uh, he works directly with Amazon. And my son was like, oh, oh, okay. that makes sense. <laughs> and so, so, I mean, that's the exact same thing that happens with, instead of subtracting, then, you know, he's presented with this evidence, which is that, okay, Santa Claus, supposed Santa Claus brought him these Legos. And it contradicts what he already knows, which is that Santa Claus is at the North Pole making stuff out of wood. And instead of subtracting the belief about Santa Claus, he he modifies his, all of his beliefs instead. So he says, okay, well, Santa Claus can, can do this if he works with Amazon, which is another thing that he was already familiar with. And um, yeah. so I don't know. It's like, that's a long-winded way of saying, I think in these note-taking apps in our personal practice, how can you kind of devote time to subtracting ideas. So in addition to the filtering, right, because, you know, not letting stuff in, that's just a, a not adding. And if you're already overwhelmed, um, you know, this isn't kind of relieving the overwhelm any, but in addition to not adding stuff that isn't adding any value, how do you get rid of stuff that is, is holding you back? Um, yeah. So it's, well, 
you know, I not think easy. that the, the, the thing that, you know, as I sort of, you know, started kind of hashing this out in my mind, you know, and I was thinking about this and I came up with the idea, I started thinking about like the idea that information overload leads to myopic consumption habits and myopic viewpoints. And, mm -hmm. you know, and this is literally what I wrote. I said, you know, basically myopic consumption habits are an occupational hazard for online marketers, self-help junkies, people who watch political news and anyone who wants to build an audience for their work. People who read yeah, self-help books keep reading self-help books, whether they watch Fox News or CNN, the news they consume becomes a filter through which they see the world. And, you know, this leads to what uh, Eli Pariser in his book, which was also called The Filter Bubble, to end up in filter bubbles and echo chambers. So basically, you know, what's interesting is, you know, we just had a guest here, then, um, you know, based on our conversation, you might really like his book. He wrote a, a book called The Life-Changing Science of Detecting Bullshit. Okay. And one of the things he said is that the more that you are surrounding yourself with like-minded people who believe the same things you do, he said, one, you end up with confirmation bias, but he said it also creates, you know, it, it creates a very polarized society. And, mm -hmm. you know, and I thought about that even from the standpoint of somebody who wants to create, um, when they have myopic consumption habits, they don't have a, you know, bold and compelling point of view. Like I remember, I think probably 2013, I stopped reading books about how to build an audience, stopped building, you know, reading books about how to, you know, use social media marketing. And the irony was that my audience started to finally grow. And I realized it's because I wasn't reading the same bullshit that everybody else was reading. Like I was diversifying the input and also reducing it so mm -hmm. that I would start to have my own ideas. And it just kind of struck me that there's a, like the consequences of this down the road are far more severe than we think. Yeah, that's a beautiful example. I mean, there's a couple of things that I love about it. I mean, I love the myopic consumption notion. And I, I think a lot of the things, everything from, well, the way you're describing it, it, it ties in nicely with the more vivid and concrete kind of physical world things that we add, right? So just in the same way that the, you know, this cluttered house, or even if it's not cluttered, it just gives your mom a bunch of stuff to do to keep everything organized. That, that, that's the mental equivalent of like these, all this information that we're trying to deal with. The other thing I really like about it is that, you know, you, you haven't, short change the role of actually knowing stuff, right? You read those books about mm -hmm. platforms. You just realized that you were saturated. And now the now what you needed to do was to, you know, stop reading those books and maybe even strip away some of the some of the things. So I think, you know, so I think one of the reasons we we don't do good less often is because we uh, we think that lazy less is the same thing as this kind of less beyond more, this noticeable less. I call it in my book. I should have called it unmistakable less, but the um, <laughs> the book is, but the um, but this less where it's like, okay, you've added, you've added, you've added, and the adding is good enough, right? You've got this knowledge now about like how to grow your online community, but then you, you don't stop. You, you subtract, you, you take stuff away. And I think that example of, you know, you reading all those books, it's like, yeah, you're an expert in this now. It's not like you're, you're ignorant. This isn't the same as I haven't read any of those books. And if I just said, okay, I'm not going to read any books to grow my online platform, it would stay small like it is. Um, so I think that's, that's a really great, um, really great illustration. Yeah. Well, I think the other thing that really I, came to mind for me as I was going through this was something Naval Ravikant said, you know, there's a, it's funny, you, despite not listening to podcasts, this is one, you know, podcast episode that I have recommended to every single person I've ever met. It's phenomenal. He did such uh -huh. a good job. Um, it's, you know, the, the title is obviously very clickbaity. It's how to get rich without getting lucky, but it's a <laughs> wealth of knowledge. I mean, I created a mind map of it and it's insane, oh, but cool. there was something he said that really struck me, uh, was he said, you know, you would be better off reading the foundational text in a given field than a hundred things about that you know, field. So he said, if you yeah. want to learn everything you want to know about business, go read the wealth of nations. And, you know, I was an economics major in college and like, mm -hmm. you know, I thought ah, this is going to be a pain in the ass. And it is a really pain in the ass type of book to read because the language is archaic. It's, you know, confusing. Uh, but what is amazing is that when you actually sit down to take the time and read it, you're like, 
holy shit, these are 200 year old economic principles that apply to every business today, like every bit of it. Like mm -hmm. it finally occurred to me that as the person who leads a company, I'm doing a lot of shit that I shouldn't be doing. And division of labor is the key to maximizing output. And you start to kind of say, okay, well, how does that apply to my life? And you realize that, wait a minute. Yeah, he's absolutely right. If you have the foundational text, the other stuff you read just sort of becomes stuff for interest almost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Um... I, how do you square that with the the updates? I mean, what I really love when I'm trying to learn about something is finding. And so, I mean, I'm as a scholar, I'm always trying to like merge stuff from different fields, and it's amazing when I can find a book where somebody has kind of like updated all the latest information from a field. I mean, because so often you're just kind of poking around, just getting little bits yeah. and pieces. But the <laughs> but how do you know like okay, what parts of Smith? I mean, Smith is obviously there are things endured. that are outdated right yeah, yeah but there's pieces that are outdated yeah yeah no i mean i so to imagine what i'm trying to do i have to basically five times a week or three times a week i'm talking to somebody like you um mm -hmm. you know yeah so between a thousand interviews and a thousand books it's kind of uh like i have this encyclopedia in my head and you know like my joke is like damn, if I could access this, you know, like with the push of a button, I would be a genius. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But yeah. I also realize not all of it is relevant too. That's, that's one thing that, you know, is, is really important, but so, you know, we're, we're getting towards, uh, you know, the end of an hour. Or so, um, so for people listening to this, you know, I, I think they're, certain things that are going to be of interest and, and the big one being how the hell the irony right is how do i get more done by using these concepts and it's <laughs> yeah. funny because um i this is something i go back to over and over again like people will tell me they have this like eight you know 10 item to-do list i'm like great make it three finish the three and then just add and surprisingly where i learned that from was from a happiness researcher um sean acor talks about this concept called success accelerants and he said you know the brain makes progress towards a goal based on the perceived distance to that goal. So I was like, if you have 15 tasks oh, yeah. in your to-do list, even if you have three of them done, you'll feel like you didn't get a damn thing done. Mm -hmm. So just put three on there and then add the ones that you want to finish later, later. But I'm, you know, from your perspective, like for somebody who's listening to this, who's a knowledge worker or creative, who wants to get better at managing their time. Um, and like I said, ironically, get more done. Um, if you were to give them sort of, you know, a practical way to take this and put it into action in their lives, um, what would you have them do? Just don't forget your other option, right? I mean, a, there are two basic ways to change situations. One is to add things to them and one is to to take things away. I mean, I, I, I love the advice from Essentialism and Cal Newport's work and, you know, Sean Acor and... But the the unique thing that I have to say is that, you know, this this is an option that we're systematically overlooking. It can help no matter what we're trying to do, whether it's get more stuff done or whether it's just be happier in general. Um, and we're not we're not using the option. We're systematically overlooking this option of taking things away. And so so one is don't forget it. And if hopefully you can remember that um, if the second kind of tier of that is can you put in place these cues for yourself that subtracting is an option? So the equivalent of the British Columbia, where they're saying, if you bring a, if you bring a thing to add, you also have to bring two things to take away where, what are the important things in your life where you can force yourself not to overlook subtraction? Because, you know, you listen to this podcast, hopefully you'll remember it. You read my book, hopefully you'll remember it forever across all contexts, but <laughs> that assuming that doesn't, always happen how can you just put in place things that make it so you don't forget this at the key decision points in your own life and i think that's the the unique piece of insight that i can offer here yeah wow uh, well this has been amazing uh, so i have one final question for you which is how we finish all of our interviews at the unmistakable creative what do you think it is that means something or something unmistakable um, i think it's uh, all the mistakable people <laughs> Um, I don't, has anybody ever said that? So I think, I mean, it's the distinct, it's the difference, right? It's the difference between the, what the current state is and what the, um, what the, un, you have to know what the current state is to make yourself unmistakable. It almost goes back to your, uh, to your example, right? To be unmistakable in your online presence, you have to understand what all the mistakable people are doing, uh, in their, 
online presences. And I think uh, I, I, it also makes me think of a, I've been watching a lot of Norm MacDonald YouTube videos since he passed away. And uh, uh, somebody asked him if he subverts the, the genre intentionally. And, and I mean, he did, or no, he didn't ask him if he did it. They asked him if he thought somebody else did it. And it was somebody he didn't think very highly of. And he said, well, to, to subvert the genre, you actually have to know the genre in the first place. And so I think, you know, when Norb's saying, okay, you've got to subvert the genre, which I think is something that he did in comedy. Uh, he's, he's mis unmistakable in that sense. Um, but to do that, you also need to know what all the mistakable people are doing. And then that, of course, you know, kind of ties into all these. Once you realize that, then it's like, okay, how do you become unmistakable? Well, it takes hard work to understand what the mistakable people are doing. It takes being thoughtful. It takes persistence um, to kind of stand out from the crowd. So that's, that's my answer. All the mistakable people is what makes, what makes you unmistakable. Amazing. Um, well, uh, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to join us and share your story, your wisdom, and your insights with our listeners. This has been awesome. Where can people find out more about you, uh, your work, the book, and everything else you're up to? The book, the book, read the book. That's the best thing. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm not, it's all the, all my thoughts condensed in uh, the most effective way I could think to get them across or in the book. I, I mean, I have a Twitter account. You can Google me and see what I'm up to the latest academic research. But I mean, the reason I wrote a book is because this was the idea that was the one that I think can, can help people. So that's the, that's the first stop. Awesome. And you can get that. There's an audible version for those of you who like to, to listen to podcasts. Amazing. And for everybody listening, we'll wrap the show with that. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Unmistakable Creative Podcast. While you were listening, were there any moments you found fascinating, inspiring, instructive, maybe even heartwarming? Can you think of anyone, a friend or a family member who would appreciate this moment? If so, take a second and share today's episode with that one person because good ideas and messages are meant to be shared. I guess not every job can ignite your curiosity about the possibilities of tech, but a job with ThoughtWorks can. ThoughtWorks is hiring for roles across the U.S., from senior and lead developers to data engineers, infrastructure consultants, and more. They're looking for talented technologists to join them in revolutionizing the tech industry. Make your mark. Learn more at ThoughtWorks.com careers.